Coming up on this week's episode of the Ask Women podcast, we have Katya on our show who is going to help us dissect the nice guy and tell us why it is so important to overcome being a nice guy. I've got my air quotes up, nice guy, to get the women you want. It is not a good tactic. It's not serving you. It's not helping you. So stop doing it, number one, and then do what we're about to explain to you instead. So keep listening. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Ask Women. I was going to say Kristen and Jill. Weird. I yeah, did not I was like, do you remember oh where you God. are right now? Jesus. She's <laughs> well, like, I, I wish it was my other podcast. This one sucks. Well, well, no, I actually, I'm doing this from bed, which I have never done before, but I moved my setup because it's so cozy. It's kind of chilly out now. And so I'm under under the covers, but not in like a sleepy way. I'm all, I've got makeup on, I've got jeans on, but I'm just nice and cozy and I don't, my, okay, but I will Okay, that's good. Better. This well, is not so Kristen typically, this is Ask Women. Kristen <laughs> just wakes up before our podcast. And then I get, I was assuming you were in right. bed all the time. I didn't realize you did us the favor and the courtesy of getting out of bed to do this cup. Okay. So then we may get great things out of you today. Well, it's kind of the opposite because normally I'm in my pajamas at my desk, but now I'm fully clothed makeup in my bed. So anyway, yeah, a little opposite. I'm pretty today. jealous of your Me setup too. right now. That's a thing. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm going to be jealous of your, all the advice you're going to give us Ooh. because you're an awesome dating and relationship coach. And oh, I now you messed it up. Yet. You practiced it like Katya. five times before. And anyway, I screwed up. Katya. <laughs> yeah. Katya Morozova. No, you did and it well. Did I? Oh, God. Right? I it up. Sorry. I did Katya. fine. Okay. You okay. did fine. It, it's, a it's a what test. What happens My when they pass the test? <laughs> it is a test. Emotional, physical. Right. Oh, what's this prize? Interesting. Lots <laughs> of guys wanna... There you go. I like it. So I, I met Katya a long time ago, but she uh, is very close friends with Kelsey Ale, who was on our show quite often, who hasn't been on in a while. And we should definitely have her back on. But it's so in case anybody who's listening, who's like, I've heard this girl before, but why is her name different? I think they sound identical, which I find so funny. But instead of talking about paleo and cooking, which is what Kelsey talks about, Katya's going to talk to us. Nothing about. <laughs> right. And me either. <laughs> um, is going to talk to us about three topics that she outlined for me. And I'm just going to read what she wrote because these are the things that I want to cover uh, during our chat today. So we're going to talk about why it's important to uh, overcome being a nice guy to get the girl or girls or women or woman you want, how to be a leader with women that you're dating or you're in a relationship with, uh, and why your relationships fizzle out in the first few months and what to do about it, which I all of them I thought were fantastic topics. But let's, let's go to the first one first. Why it's important to overcome being a nice guy to get the girl you want. Well, Katja, can you tell me a little bit about being a nice guy and what that actually means in your definition as a woman and then yes. as an expert who's also been working with you know tons of men to help them? What does it mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, so the first thing I'll say is a lot of people like read that. A lot of guys who probably identify with being a nice guy don't view that as a, as a negative thing, right? It, and in the context that I'm about to define it, I view it as kind of a problem, right? And it, I want to separate this from being a good guy, Mm -hmm. like being a good guy and being a nice guy are two different things for me. So let me define what a nice guy is. So a nice guy is someone who, you know, goes above and beyond to do things for women that he barely knows or doesn't even know at all. And Mm -hmm. he does things to get, even if he says that he doesn't, So nice guys will typically be asleep to this, the reality that like, he's not going to be willing to admit that his actions are a manipulation and that he's secretly hoping for something in return. So he'll like do things for women. He'll go above and beyond to do things for women and he'll want something in return, like, you know, attention, sex, affection, you know, time spent together. He'll want a relationship. He'll want validation So it'll be a very like kind of give to get mentality. Well, can I make one note that it may not even be something they're aware of, right? They, they, that's the thing that they're not, it's not like a manipulative thing. It ends up being a bit of a manipulation, but it's not actually 
a premeditated rule thing. Okay. So I just want to add that in there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, for instance, years ago when I was on my, you know, when I had just started my self-development journey, like I was asleep to the fact that I would do things like this, that I used, you know, my sexuality to get things from guys or that I would put on these certain facades with men to, to get what I wanted. And, you know, waking up to that as a truth, as something that I was doing was very difficult. (laughs) It was like pretty painful to go, uh huh. Yeah. Well, I was going to sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I, I think that that would be interesting for guys to hear as well. Because a lot of guys do feel yeah. led on or misled by women who are leaning on their sexuality to e- to either get things or they're they're leaning on those things because they don't know what else to use. So I'd like you to explain that a bit more about how you were using that. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So. I think I would put on this facade that I was a certain type of woman, you know, like, like I was a nice girl that, that I was kind of had it all together. I had the career, I had kind of everything in order and I would hide things. Like I would hide my past. Like when I was growing up, I had a, um, a mother who was mentally ill, which created like a pretty tumultuous upbringing. So I would rebel. I would go out. I was super promiscuous. I would drink a lot. I would take drugs. And so when I got older and kind of, I outgrew that, I, I hid that, I hid that side of me. And I would put on this front of like being this kind of girl that had it all together, that didn't have a past. And, um, and also didn't have like kind of like, I would also hide my sexuality. Like I wouldn't really like present myself as a sexual person. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that was something that I, you know, did for years to hide this other part of myself. And I know that a lot of guys go through this where they feel like, especially guys, they nice guys feel like they have to hide their sexuality. Like they can't, they can't present it to women or women will be afraid. They will be, you know, they will run away. They will think that they're too aggressive. Or that they'll be found out that they're attracted to them. That's a, that's a big fear for a lot of guys too. Oh God, she's going to know I want her. So. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And of course, you know, like what's behind that is that fear of rejection. Like if I show the real me, am I going to, you know, ward this person away? And unfortunately when they don't show the real you know, the real them, then the, the woman has no idea who this person is, right? Like they never get a sense for who is this guy? Like, what does he stand for? What does he want? And that uncertainty, not uncertainty, that ambiguity that women feel from men who are nice. It's weird. It's like, I can't trust this guy because I don't know who he is. Like if, even if he was a jerk, it would be like, okay, well, I know who he is. Right. And now I can decide what to do with it. That's right. And I can buy into it if I want to. But if a woman doesn't know who you are and doesn't know who you, you know, what you stand for, it's like, this is, this feels weird. This feels dangerous because everyone has needs. Everyone has wants. And I don't believe that you don't have any. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to, I think that's a great description uh, of a nice guy. And I'm sure many guys who are listening are like, yeah, I do tend to do some of those things. Again, I want to like repeat that it's not meant to be manipulative. You, at the core, you think that you're doing the right thing because it's maybe all that you know how to do or you're not comfortable doing the other things that may actually build and create attraction. Yeah. I do think there are guys out there that do do it manipulatively and intentionally. Not tons, but I'm sure there are some. Really? Yeah. I think. Yeah. But tell me more about those guys, about like what what you mean by that. Like you're talking about... Sorry. It's the guys that I think maybe hold some anchor toward women. I don't want to say the mm. incel type, but it's guys that are are essentially like, I bought you dinner, not that you owe me sex, but like, I bought you this, I did this for you, I did that for you, and then get angry when they're not feeling like you're giving them what they've quote unquote earned. And you see that even in just asking for a phone number. So if a guy is out with with, um, a bunch of his friends talking to one girl, and then that girl happens to say, after they talked for 15 minutes, I have a boyfriend, they get angry because it's like, but I just put in all this time and now now you're not giving me your phone number. You misled me. 
So I think I've definitely dealt with it and I'm sure. I still don't think that that's a premeditated thing. Like I still think that that's sincerely from their point of view, I'm doing all the right things. Why is this not happening? Or why would you keep talking to me and smiling at me? Because you know what I want. Mm. It's just a frustration because there's all this stuff happening underneath from I definitely think there are guys out there that look at it as an exchange. Not not tons of them, but but I do think that happened. For sure, for sure. And I, I I totally agree with that as well. But those are also guys who are like, okay, I, I, think I do these things and then this is what I get in return. And when it doesn't happen, it gets very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, but I... I think a lot of guys, like the, the guys who do it premeditatively are actually guys who have probably done a lot of like quote unquote self-development, but really just like learned a bunch of PUA techniques. I think those guys do do it premeditatively. Like more so than just like the average guy. I think the average guy who hasn't started to like, who hasn't read a bunch of books and like really try to figure this thing out. Like they're more like unconscious. They're passively doing it. But people who have been on the journey and still continue to use the kind of techniques, like those people, they kind of, they know what they're doing. And to me, that feels like that's a lot more dangerous um, than the first guy, the yeah. I hear what you're but, saying. But I, Marnie, to your point, like, I, I do think that like that reaction, that negative reaction, that anger is, is not premeditated. It's like, it's like the, the mommy response, you know, it's like, oh, you didn't give me what I want. Like I, I just put in all of this time to get your attention and now you're not giving me what I want. And so I'm mad. Like, that's like a very childish response. So that's like a, like an undeveloped, underdeveloped response to like a grown up situation. Yeah. It's like stamping so your foot case, and saying, I, I didn't just, get this because yeah. Yeah. And, I, and that happens, you know, if you, if you don't learn and understand why things are happening, if you continue to repeat that pattern, it keeps happening. You get angrier and angrier and angrier and more frustrated with women because you aren't diving in and understanding yeah. how women work, how men work, what's going on in the social dynamic. Before you, you explain like why it's important to overcome being a nice guy and actually how to do it. I do want to dig a little bit deeper into what you said before about using your sexuality. Cause what you were talking about before to explain your past, you had said you cut off your sexuality. I want to hear about how you used your sexuality with men to get things. And at what mm. age were you doing this and why? Cause that, that's really interesting. Yes. Tell us because I want to use some of those techniques. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> person needs to start using (laughs) sexuality. I think probably like I would tease guys a lot. Like that was, (laughs) yeah. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm about to tell this story. I was just thinking about this the other day. Like one time, like (laughs) I, I was, I went on a date with this guy who I worked with and we like went out and this is like really bad, right? Like, cause I was like in my early twenties, yeah. like I never share any of this stuff. You should. We went out and then I was just, I was just like, just acting out. Like I was, we went to a bar and I was like dancing on the, like the chairs or the, even the tables. Like amazing. We, we were at some dive bar. There was no one in there. And I was doing that. And then later he like dropped me off and I knew that nothing was going to happen. Wait, so this was somebody that you were on, on a date like, with, or this is just somebody you were hanging out with? Well, that's the, I guess that's the thing is that like, you know, back then maybe I would hang out with people where it was like, we don't know where this is going yet, but I I think it was a date. I would, I would call it a date. And I was like, he dropped me off and there was a cat that like kind of emerged from the darkness and was like hanging out on the, uh, the sidewalk. And I like got down on my knees and I was like petting this cat, but I had like my ass in the air. And I was clearly like just, just teasing this guy in this like very overt kind of way. And I know this is like a super like overt example, but like shit like that. And then I think as I got older, like it was just, it was like more and more subtle. So like the younger that I was, the more like outlandish were my shenanigans. And I also used to hang out with like a bunch of like party guys because I was a party girl. And I think like when I got older, it was just like, it was really subtle. It was like a lot of like eye contact and like touching, like I'm a very touchy feely person. So I know that if I wanted to use that, I could use it to my advantage. Yeah. Wait, so I want to dive into this a bit more. So when you were petting the cat, 
what what was that to say you can't have this but I like that you're looking at me or yeah okay for sure but yeah okay so so if he would have actually taken action you would have said, no, 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 you're misreading this. You know, I don't really know what would have happened, but I think there was like, I had, we had created enough like distance in the, like there was enough distance in the dynamic where maybe I knew that he wasn't going to act on it. Did you want him to? Honestly, I have no idea. I think I was just performing. Like, I think it was just a, like a performance. Right. Well, sometimes it just feels nice to feel sexy or feel noticed. That's right. And so it doesn't always mean that you want, just because a woman might maybe dangle her goods, I don't know, in front of a uh-huh. dude a little bit, it doesn't mean she's saying, come here. And I know that's confusing for guys. It could mean that she just is feeling herself and is wanting to feel the the sexiness of, of her own being. Right. So then, yeah, what, so then for that guy, what would have so if, if you're if like I know it's really hard because it's the long not that long ago but it's it's a while back and you were saying you don't actually know what you were thinking at that time whether you were attracted to him or not so let's say to draw it to the importance to overcoming being a nice guy how would a guy in that situation who in his mind he's on a date with a girl you're both kind of unsure about whether or not you're into each other maybe because he was acting like a nice guy and you were acting like a party girl and so there was more distance between you how does he bridge that gap so that you know you're not just sticking your butt in the air but he actually can get you to pay attention to him be attracted to him and maybe do more with him because i think the nice guy just ignores the butt in the face, mm. right? And is like really yeah. scared to do anything. So what is the bold leader approach where it's mm. not like, That's a yeah, really where you're question. not like, wait a second, I put my butt in everybody's face. How are you reading this as I want you? So <laughs> yeah, I'm just betting yeah. my cat. No, that's a really... <laughs> That's a really, really great question. Immediately what came to mind was like calling me out, you know, like if, if I'm doing this whole like performance Mm -hmm. thing, like I would, if a guy had called me out, I would have not known what to say. And I would have had a lot of respect for him. Like had he done it. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Like, I know what you're doing, you know, or just like, I think that would have, brought awareness to it. So the reason I say calling out is because I have another example of when like I was hiding like my past and my sexuality and um, a man who turned into my, my, my boyfriend did call me out for doing that. Like he, he was asking me questions as he was kind of probing and like really trying to get to know me. And I was not like really interested in sharing. Like I was getting really embarrassed and I was kind of shutting down. And so I remember him saying, you know, Hey, like, I'm not going to judge you for anything that you've done. You know, like I'm not going to, um, like he gave me permission. So that was, that would be like an example of being, you know, being a leader, being someone who like sees something about you, see, sees something about me and goes, Hey, like maybe this is something for you to look at. Like this, this behavior, this thing that you're doing, just, it feels, it doesn't feel authentic. It doesn't feel true. So that would be an example of like when a guy did do that for me, which like, I still, obviously I still remember Mm -hmm. that, like that shifted something for me. I was like, Oh, I don't have to hide this thing. I don't have to, you know, pretend. And, and yeah, and we ended up being in a relationship and he, he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot about myself. He like, he kind of pushed my edges and and pushed my boundaries, but like in a really healthy way, yeah. like he made me look at my shit. Well, okay. So, but then how does he avoid becoming the therapist? Cause like, so I'm thinking that in your twenties, this may be appreciated, but would this, would that kind of thing be appreciated now in your thirties when you have done all this work? I guess anytime you're being called out or somebody's seeing you for something that may not be authentic, it kind of does always feel nice. Cause you're like, oh, okay, I can drop this charade or, I mean, I don't, so right. I, I'm just, yeah. I'm, I mean, I guess it depends, like, you know, and this is where like balance comes in because I also know what it's like to like go on the coaching journey and, and become a coach and then see, start seeing things about people that they weren't seeing about themselves right. and then try to like solve their problems. So I know what that's like. And, you know, I've been through that journey where I was that person where I was like, 
you know, coaching guys on a date. Right. And they're like, shut <laughs> and, up. I just want you to pet your cat. <laughs> Literally. I don't want anything else. <laughs> um, exactly. Well, I, right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, I want to pet your cat. Um, <laughs> wait, so Kristen, actually, I have a question because I, I want to I wanna hear like the comical bantery way. I know I'm putting you on the spot that you would call out <laughs> Katya for, for doing something like that, or like a girl, that that would be not shaming, not being like, what, what the fuck are you doing? Like you're bending over and then like being aggressive with her. What is the, pl- what would be a playful way to call that out? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that cats show off their ass too, because they walk right. with their tail in the air. So I would, I don't know, maybe jokingly say something about like, did you learn that from the cat too? <laughs> or, you know, something to that extent. Yeah. That's yeah. Cute. You know, it's like, it's not a jerky way, but you're, you're calling it out and you're not going to, the, the thing is, if you don't call it out in more of an, ob- or in a less obvious way, then it's like, you're sounding you're like you're trying to be nice about it. Well, yeah, it's like or- you're just own, you're being kind of like ballsy about it. Right. I, and I, I, I kind of like that because I think so, calling it out might get confusing for some people because they can take like the rude, aggressive route and then you can get into a strange dynamic with somebody. But I, I, I also yeah. agree that calling it out, being like, what are you, what are you doing? You don't need to do this stuff. Like, come on, sit over here. Come talk to me. We don't need to put on a show for each other. Like, well, I mean, on that note, like what comes up for me is, is what you just said, like, you know, Kristen, you just delivered this like beautiful <laughs> like way of calling out yeah, she should a be a dude. On, knees on the sidewalk. Right. Exactly. But like where you're coming from is like, you've done, I know we don't know each other, but I'm guessing you've done a lot of work on yourself. Like you, like <laughs> we really you, don't know each other. Wait, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I do the least work. Yeah. No, She's in I'm bed about the in work. her clothes with right. lipstick on. But She's like, not doing like, any. <laughs> Yeah. Zero. Right. Work. So yeah. But what I'm, what I'm kind of getting at is that, you know, it's, it's that like growth isn't always easy. It isn't always smooth. So right. this is the thing that guys are afraid of. It's like, Oh, I'm going to be a jerk. It's like, okay, well maybe you will. Yeah. yeah. And maybe that's you thing. will first. Yeah. First and maybe that's the growth that you have to yeah. go through. You know, like I, I'm just going to use this example because it's the thing that popped into my mind. I ended a a couple of friendships with women like years ago in my mid twenties. And I did it in a really shitty way in a way that I regret it. And it was kind of harmful. Like it was kind of traumatizing for me, but it was, it was what I had access to at the time. Like I was growing, I knew I wanted something different and I knew I had to make these choices. And more recently I did the same thing, but I did it in a very different way. And while it didn't go amazing, I knew that I was, had integrity. I knew that I was being responsible with my words and I knew I did it in, in like the most evolved way that I possibly could. Well, you're you're saying something so important because no one ever thinks about the intent behind what someone's saying. And it's the same thing with like in the news or the, or pop culture, if a celebrity says something wrong, no one's looking at the intent behind it. So if you're not out to hurt someone's feelings and you're going to call someone out because they're acting a certain way, like showing their ass like a cat would or whatever, your intent is not not to belittle or hurt that person. It's to kind of get them to be on the same page and to get them to yeah. see reality. So you may feel like a jerk, but just remember if you have true good intent behind it, hang on to that and let that lead you. If that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And this is where like you, I think as men who are overcoming being a nice guy and are on the journey to like really knowing themselves, owning their value and being leaders with in their life and with women, you know, that they have to separate for a while, like they have to separate a woman's response from their action, like the action that they need to take. So if something might be right for them, might be true for them, it might have an impact on that other person. And that doesn't mean that that's a bad thing, right? Like we all have to go through situations that are trying. We all have to, you know, move through conversations and relationships where people respond in a negative way because of something we said or did. Like, we, we can't live in this bubble of like constantly trying to avoid how someone is going to react. Yeah. We're going to stuff our own growth. We're going to, I can't think of this word. We're going stunt to it? Is that, stunt, stunt. Thank you. We're going to stunt our, our own growth. growth. If we're constantly, 
We're going to stuff it. Right up that cat's ass. Um, (laughs) (laughs) We're going to stunt our own growth if we're like constantly wondering what's happening over there, you know? So that, and people who are nice, like nice guys have this level of like enmeshment in their relationships. You know, another aspect of being a nice guy is kind of being a codependent guy, right? You're constantly thinking about what's happening over there, how you're affecting this other person and your actions are not independent of that. And so that's something that the nice guy, that's like the journey that the nice guy has to go through. It's so, it's so funny because Actually, you know what? Let's take a break because we're about 26 Mm -hmm. minutes in. Nobody can. I'm talking to the person in my closet. Uh, Let's take a break and we're going to come back and dive into this a little bit more because I know we all have something to say, but I'll pick a number and whoever is closest to it gets to go first (laughs) when we get back from this break. So we'll be back in a second. I used to take such good care of myself. I was always taking fish oil and multivitamins. And then I was like, oh, this is a big giant pain in the butt having to go to the store every time. It was exhausting trying to keep up with it all, but now that's where Care-of comes in. Care-of is an awesome wellness brand that makes it so easy to get the right vitamins, supplements, protein powders, whether you're looking for better skin or more energy, all packaged together for you in such a convenient way. I just did their online quiz. It was so fast and easy, and I liked it because I got to talk about myself and my lifestyle, what I eat, what I don't eat, that kind of thing. And it made this personalized daily vitamin pack for me that would ship monthly. And this is a really good time to do it because we're starting to enter the winter months, and those are long and hard, and so you want to have everything in your corner to make you feel good. It's also super convenient. It gets shipped right to your door in daily little packs. So if you're running off for the weekend, you can grab some of those packs, throw them in your suitcase. And also it's really easy to see where they source their ingredients from to ensure only the highest quality products. So go get your personalized packs of these vitamins and supplements that will come monthly to your door. It's so easy and simple. So for 25% off your first care of order, go to takecareof.com and enter promo code ASKWOMEN. That's 25% off your first order. Go to takecareof.com and enter ASKWOMEN. All right, we are back. I have a number in my head. It's between one and a hundred. Kristen, you tell me what it is. It's a lot of numbers. One and one and fifty. One high, between one and fifty. Oh, okay, I can count to fifty. Um, thirty-seven. Ooh. Oh man, mine was going to be thirty. Oh, it's thirty-two. Oh. Kristen, you <laughs> <Okay>. go first. <laughs> oh. Whoa! All right. Well, what I was going to say about that was what was it? It was okay. So a friend of mine. Playing the role versus, you know, playing the nice guy versus the not nice guy. I want to get your opinion on this. So a friend of mine is dating this girl, woman, whatever, and she's younger. So I'll call her a girl because I now feel like an old woman. (laughs) Um, So he's dating this girl and he was having uh, a fight with her kind of through text and he sent me screenshots. And so she said in the messages, you talk down to me or, or you talk to me like I'm dumb. And so this friend of mine, he's very, very, very smart and intellectual. And it's one of those mm. things where he can't really control it. Everyone and is so just dumb. I did. I, to- <laughs> right. Yeah. It, and they are right. to him. Like if you played like Scrabble with him, there would be, he makes a word like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious like off the board every right. single time. He's impossible to beat. So in his scenario, he... He didn't know that. So she said that to him. He sent it to me. And I said, I agree, not in a bad way, but you might have to soften your edges a little bit in the way in which you talk to her because you're a very smart, educated dude. And she is also smart, but not on the same level in that sense. And so then he wrote back um, to me before he sent it to her saying something like, basically, he said, I'll start dumbing down the way I'm talking Mm -hmm. to you. And I said, no, 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 you do not want to do that. So what's a way for him to to still be really smart and intellectual, but not a dick and not also being a pushover where he's going to dumb himself down? Yeah, this is an awesome topic. You said topic. specific. So that was... No, that's really <laughs> great. Specific. Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, to me, like this is a conversation, like what you're describing. I don't know the context of their relationship. Like, are they dating? Are they in a relationship? Like, They're dating and like exclusively now, I think, and they're not really okay. seeing anyone else, but they haven't said anything about being boyfriend, girlfriend. 
Okay. So I would not have this conversation over text um, because this is like a bigger topic in my view. In fact, I would say never yeah. have arguments over text well, ever. Especially he's ever spelling skills in text, everything's spelled, right? It's like you're going to, oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would move this away from text and I would have like an actual conversation and for him, you know, like be an example of a leader in this relationship by doing so, you know, it sounds like she is feeling insecure around him. So I would get really curious about that. And sorry, what was her, what was her text again? What did she say? To it was him? essentially saying something like you, talk you, you talk down to me or make me feel like I'm wrong. Like everything that I say is wrong or not not smart yeah. enough, something to that extent. I'm actually going to look for it while you're talking. Yeah. So I would first say, Hey, you know, I hear what you're saying. I'm I would sorry acknowledge you feel that way. That's just tough. her point of view and say, Hey, yeah, I'm sorry that you, that that's going on for you and that I'm making you feel this. I would just own it and be like, I'm sorry, I'm making you feel that way and not try to argue and then just say, Hey, um, I think this would be a better conversation to have maybe in person or over the phone. Do you mind if we do that? And then in the conversation, I would just hear her out. Like, can you give me a specific example? Like, you know, is this something specific that I said or did? Because whenever like in conflict, you don't want to do this whole like big amorphous blob conflict. You want to do like laser in on, Hey, let's tackle one issue. So what did I say or do that made you feel this way? And then from there, let's again, hear her out. What does she have to say? Like, probably he didn't intend to sound that way. He probably didn't want to like belittle her. Right. So he can hear her out and then say, I got what you said. Thanks for sharing. This is, that's, that wasn't my intention. Well, at first he think I think he should ask for her IQ score or for her IQ and <laughs> right, then go exactly. from there. Like I'm just talking. So, <laughs> yeah. That, that would be the best way. To ruin a relationship. <laughs> um, no, but I just, I, I, what I basically <laughs> said to him was, to not let her know that he's adjusting his speech because he was going to straight up say, okay, well, I'll start talking more at like this level. And I said, no, don't absolutely do not say that. Just start doing it. And so yeah. there might not be and, this harsh transition of like, you know, not look at me. Yeah, I'm but on that's, your like, level. That's, him, that's him being reactive, right? Like she said what she said, just right. like hear her out, you know? But that's right. also him fumbling through the dark, right? Because it's he because he doesn't know that's what's right. actually trigger, triggering her, why it's triggering her, and he may not be aware of how what he's saying comes across to pe- other people. And so, like to bring this back to the nice guy conversation, the difference between being a good guy and a nice guy. A good guy, in my opinion, would would say, you know what? I actually really like how I talk to people. Like, this is what you say in your mind. I like how I talk to you. I'm proud of it. But I want to hear what other people have to say. Because if I I am affecting somebody that way, I'd want to hear about it. And maybe I can make some changes. A nice guy would either get really frustrated or on the flip side, he would kind of do what Kristen was saying. He would yes, start adjusting. For sure. Right? Out of panic and 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 unclearness because he doesn't want that confrontation or he wants to please that girl and not upset her. And then he would probably piss her off more because he wasn't really addressing and talking to her, which is what it sounds like she needs in that moment is for him to see her right. for one second. And, and um, she- but on his – like. Yeah, sorry. I was gonna say, my husband says that all the time. I, I'm I'm doing all the things I'm supposed. I think I'm supposed to be doing. I'm like, well, you never asked me. <laughs> like, yes, you're doing things that maybe you think are right, but it's it's not resonating for me. And that you know that that's a big that was a big deal for him to to hear that statement because that was very frustrating for him as well. And my husband is a good man, but there are certain times when he does attempt to be, and I'm putting air quotes, nice to do something to like not step on a landmine and then it, it becomes inauthentic and false and everything we talked about at the beginning of the show, which is why you have said it's really important for guys not to do, I hate that it's called being nice because being nice isn't a bad thing. It's not, it's, 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 it's I don't know another well, term think, for it. The, like without saying it's being like, a wimp or a pussy yeah. or like yeah. it's bending over backwards for somebody without knowing why you're doing it. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is just like a survival strategy. So, I mean, I think the the one thing I want to say here is that like, 
It's not bad to be nice. It's, but just notice that it's a, it's a, it's like a survival strategy. It's been around for a really long time. You know, like I, we, we picked it up during our childhood, right? Like it was something that we had to do to get by, but now as adults, it doesn't really work anymore. You know, it doesn't, it's an out. I don't know if it worked as, as a child either. Well, if we were nice to get something that we, that we wanted, right. Or gain the affection of a parent who maybe wasn't available to us, then yeah. Like a, a strategy that a yeah, child, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like a strategy that a child uses is like, they're doing the best that they can. Right. And, and honestly, it's on the parent for them to figure out their shit because like, it's not on the child to, to figure that out. So the child does the best that he, she can. and. And then they, they're like, oh, okay, that worked. Let's try that again. Well, we've used that right? in like have- culture to raise children. It's like, if you do this, then you get this. Yeah. So it's so programmed. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I, I say to my kids, ask me nicely. <laughs> <laughs> like, because they just say, can I have this? And I'm like, and ask me nicely. And then suddenly they get it. So that, that is interesting that you're just like, okay, if you just be nice, then you get it. Mm. That, that it is interesting. It's ingrained in you. And then sort of, as you get older, you, you have to learn how to sway that. It's like a little you, bit. You can ask for a TV show at NBC super nicely. You're not going to get it. Right. You know, so you have to adjust to mm-hmm. adulthood. Interesting. Mm-hmm. That is very interesting. I like this. I do want to talk yeah. about, um, the other topic that you had had said, let me just see how much time we have. Okay, we're about, about you know forty minutes I know, in. Like, but that topic uh, the, alone. <laughs> I know. Well, it, well, actually, maybe. Do you want to give maybe two strategies to guys on how to stop or at least be aware of the nice guy behavior? Because mm-hmm. once you're aware of something, you can start to alter it. So let's let's provide two strategies mm-hmm. and then see how much time we have to dive mm-hmm. into the last mm-hmm. topic. Mm-hmm. Okay, a couple of strategies to start to overcome being a nice guy. So. Okay. The the first one and the biggest one is to get a sense of what it is that you really want, because typically people who are nice, especially men, right? They were taught early on that they shouldn't have needs and wants and desires. So that's like conditioning, right? And you have to condition yourself out of it, which is a process and it takes time. So this is something that I give my clients to do is I'll say, you know, write down what is it that you really want? Like, how do you want your dating life to look like? How do you want your relationships to look like? How do you want other people to show up for you? So like, you know, women to show up for you. So I asked them to, you know, kind of take the laser off of the other, which guys typically do. How do I make her want me? How do I make her like me? How do I make her, her, her? Like, it's all about her. So if you could just set that aside for just a moment and think about what it is that you want, you know, how do you want a date to go? Like, do you want to touch women on a first date? Like, do you want to make physical contact with another human? Great. Like describe that. Like, what would it be like for you to express um, a need or a want or desire. Like, you know, I really want to go something very simple is like, I want to go to this restaurant. Guys are always like, how can I create this great experience for her? And it's like, okay, well, what about what you want? Maybe you like improv comedy. Maybe that's something that you want to do. So, so write down like maybe a list of five to 10 places that you want to go on a first date that you can kind of pitch to, you know, to a potential, yeah, a p- potential date. So that would be the first thing is getting in touch with your own needs, wants, and desires and actually writing them down and trying to get specific as possible. Yeah. And then the second thing would be, yeah, just, oh gosh, I'm about to like name some high level shit that I don't know if is going to be super helpful, but (laughs) I'm like, I'm like really connect with the emotion of shame. (laughs) Like, Oh my God. I love shame. Yeah. No, like, like, like that's in my bio on my Instagram and my Twitter is how much I love shame and connecting with shame, I oh think is God. so helpful. <laughs> yeah. So like where, where has it been? So shame is, is, a, is what dry will, will basically shut us down from wanting anything. It's like, I want this. I feel shame. I can't want this. Right. Like, so connecting with shame, like where do you shy away from asking for what you want? Like where, where does shame start to come up? Where, like, where do you feel like you would be inappropriate? 
Right. Like a lot of guys shy away from the, the sexuality piece, especially, right? Nice guys really struggle with this. Like, so where is reaching out and touching someone, asking for a kiss, right? Like talking about something sexual. Like, what are your opinions about that? Just starting to dig into, like, well, we don't talk about these things because, you know, a woman's going to think that I'm just like a sleaze or I'm just out for sex. Like, start to notice the beliefs that you have around topics that you shy away from. So I think that would be my second suggestion. Yeah. But how do you squash that shame? So like, how do you, you bring that into reality? Because if you believe that everybody feels this way, how do you suddenly start to realize, oh, this isn't bad to do, or this isn't bad. I guess listening to this podcast, because we give you um, the insight on that, or even like working with each of us. But I, I think that guys in their own world can also tap into the resources that they may have where, or even like if you're on the bus and you're like, can I ask you a few questions? Like if you're seriously curious, it it might creep out a few people, but I think there's some people who would actually be really responsive to you if you frame it in, in an okay way where, you know, you're actually just very curious about these things, whether or not other people believe these things as well, just to hear from the other side that it's not so shameful or it's okay to do those things. Yeah. I think like on that note, bringing this, these topics up with like friends, like trusted confidants would be a great starting point. Yeah. So maybe not the person beside you on the bus. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, well, it's almost uh, good to do it to the person on the bus because then yeah. you don't ever have to see that person again right. unless exactly. you take the bus all the right. time. Um, in that case, you'll have to buy a car. Right. But with shame for me, the way I use it is I try to use it in a in a way to create character and personality, but not to but not to have enough to hold you back. So mm. if you have shame about something think about if it would shame some if someone else would feel shame if you saw someone doing that same behavior say talking to someone on the bus would you feel shame for that person if not then you can do it but if that person starts taking off their pants if they start taking taking off their pants then you might feel shame for them then you wouldn't want to do it does I almost use it as like an outsider view oh I like Like if I were looking at someone I like that that's great yeah Okay, I like that, like writing down 10 things of yours and then even just, you know, mentally picturing those things saying like, would I judge somebody for doing this? Have I seen people doing that? Does it? I love that. I think that's really good because it it lets you practice these things sort of in a safe space and also check in with yourself. Kristen, we did this episode a while ago. You, You actually weren't on it, but I was talking to... What is his name? I think it was Chris. I feel so horrible that I forget what his name was, but uh, he was a social data analysis. Analysis. Analyst? Na- analyst? <laughs> yes. yes, that would make sense. Okay. So that's what, so he basically studied human interaction. I thought that was absolutely Ooh. amazing. And he had all these tools for like getting over approach anxiety and just calming anxiety in general and getting over fears. And so, you know, one of the things, one of the tools that he had said, it was um, episode like 296. I don't know. It was a really great episode, obviously, because Kristen was not there. It was unbelievable. Right. That's what um, great. Uh, but he, he was basically talking about something very similar where you like float up and you talk to yourself in third person, you know? Yeah. So like you, you're looking at yourself yes. doing these things. It's, it's, oh my God, it was, was actually a really cool tool. I was just saying that. Uh, I have learned this new thing that I've been doing, not learned it, but I started doing this new thing, which sounds kind of creepy, but it's really helpful. Um, I, I like hearing stories, just for a little background, I like hearing stories about people who say they've had a near-death experience. Mm. I know it sounds weird, but no, they, a, not at all. A lot of it's so fascinating, and you know, it creates you know that curiosity or that answers maybe some questions you have or whatever about yeah. the afterlife. But what a lot of the people say is that they flow outside of their body and they're on the ceiling, mm. and really? so they see themselves say on the operating table or in this car accident or wherever from way above, and it in because people have said several times on the ceiling, I've now pictured myself, it's creepy, but I feel like I see myself in the corner up in the ceiling, looking down on myself in bed. And I look at myself as my soul up in the corner, judging this person here on the 
bed or mm-hmm. whatever activity I'm doing, mm-hmm. which is again, most likely in bed, but not a fun one. <laughs> and you start being so much nicer to yourself because yeah. you have such a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually really cool. That's yeah. funny because a lot of the people that I know who've done ayahuasca, that's what they say as well, where they're floating above their body or they're floating above their world. And they they right. can they can see it kind of like um, ghosts from a Christmas carol yeah. sort of thing. So yeah, right. that's interesting. I wonder if the same part of the brain is triggered if you have that type of experience when you go into like a fear place. Maybe that's what happens for people. Yeah. Or for the God angle, like maybe your spirit just floats out of your body and just has a chance to say, do I want to leave or do I want to stay? Right. And when you're looking at it from that angle where you're above, the things below don't seem as not as heavy important or as intense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Well, this, that's also like what you're describing too, though, uh, you know, as like a, another kind of strategy to even gain access to what you're talking about is something that I always give my clients is advise them to learn how to meditate. And so like what you're describing is something that we do have access to, right? It's like, you know, there's the, the observer, like we, we have access to the, the observer, that part of us that's like, you know, like there's a part of us that's taking the action that's thinking, you know, thinking the thoughts. And then there's the part of us that's watching us thinking the thoughts. And so meditation, like all my clients take on meditation. I like, I'm an evangelist for meditation, but it's, it's that thing that starts to give you that gap between here's this impulsive action, this kind of survival strategy that I'm constantly taking. And then almost like a piece of gum, like you're like, you know, like yeah. separating yourself from that and going, Oh, here, here, here's me what watching really this thing that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like meditation is so, so powerful for that to like still your mind and go, Oh, okay. I have, I have control. I have more control than I thought because a lot of people who are kind of stuck in that strategy, that nice guy strategy, they don't have awareness, right? It's what we were talking about earlier. They don't have awareness that they're doing that. Yeah, but they actually have full control. And we actually had Dave Asprey on our show. It was it was interesting, the episode that we we did with him, because I think I was so locked into my definition of biohacking that I kept, I wasn't really <laughs> clear on where he was going. But at the very end, he like succinctly wrapped it all up where he was basically saying like, you have control over your environment and you can hack it however you want. Like, and I thought that was a very cool thing to say. One thing I I, I do want to add on to the, what you just brought up about, about meditation, and then we're going to wrap up the show. So f- I, I'll be honest, when people say meditation to me, like literally I just, I shut down because I'm like, I've tried it. I've tried to stay quiet. It doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. So I went to um, a summer camp for adults recently and had, Aww. first of all, the best time ever. It was awesome. awesome. Um, but separate from that, there was just amazing people that were there. So I ended up, I was making bracelets because that's what you do at summer camp. We were like doing arts and crafts and I was sitting beside this guy and we started talking and I was like, you know what? I feel like really zoned out doing this right now. It's nice. I'm having a conversation, but I'm really relaxed. I can feel my nervous system actually like settling down. And he goes, he goes, yeah. He's like, this is a form of meditation for you. And I was like, I didn't, it's, it's interesting because I always pictured meditation you know, your legs crossed, doing yoga, complete silence. And that's why it would always frustrate me when people would say, you know, that's, I feel great because I meditate. And I'm like, I can't do that. So he started talking to me um, and saying, the funny thing is, my, in my former life, my job was to help people find their form of meditation because people meditate in all different ways. And I thought that was really interesting. And then now he's a doctor and he uses um, making bracelets as a form of meditation for his cancer patients. Wow. Well, I just I just did a 500 piece puzzle the other day, Marnie, and it was the exact same thing. <gasps> it was the best. I love yes, that. And I've never done a full puzzle before. And so it was like, oh, I just escaped, together when you get went back. to another place. <laughs> I was with my grandma. We did it together. But when we had a little I conversation, but really not, and it flew by, it was like five hours. And all of a sudden it, we were done. I felt, this puzzle. I felt so great because I just relaxed and zoned out. Like a cat on a telephone. That's what it was at the end. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on a lace doily. <laughs> like that's what it ends up being. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is, but that, but I just want like to, to add on to what, you were saying, Katya, because I think that some people close their ears as soon as you hear meditation. And right. I just want to, totally. I, I want to reiterate that there's so many different ways. So the ways that he was saying, he's like, some people meditate through dance. Some people will meditate through exercise. Some people meditate through walking. Just getting some into people meditate zone. through eating. 
Yeah, it's just getting into fishing. that zone where everything for, through fishing. So it's like, like it's oh. it's about finding those spaces for you where things can be quiet and you can focus. It sounds like you, you can focus on something else to actually focus on you. So yeah. it's not like you're living in your head. And that's where I wanted to end the show. I know we, we were going to talk about uh, relationships fizzling out. Can I just well, share one more thing? Yes, I, please, please, please. Okay. I just, I just want to share this final thought that, um, about the, the shame piece. Yeah. So I started thinking about earlier, just, just in this conversation when I thought the thought, oh, there's this story that immediately popped into my mind about you know, getting down on my knees on the sidewalk, sticking my ass in the air. Immediately I felt shame. Like I was like, Oh my God, like, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, Oh wow. Here's that, that thing that I've thought about sharing. Like, and I don't want to share that. I don't want people to hear about, you know, this, this part of, of my life. And then there was like, immediately after that was like, well, there's this commitment that I have to, to being honest, to being transparent to being authentic, you know, and that's a commitment that I have in my, in my own life. So kind of going back to the, the, the two tips, like the strategy for dealing with, with shame is, you know, start to notice where you hold yourself back. Like, where do you not share the things that you really want to that you most mm-hmm. want to share. But but Katya, the most interesting part is that that's what made you to me very endearing. I was just going to say you the same share thing. The side of you that, yeah. So those weaknesses or those things that people would consider yes. shameful might be what connects you to that person. It's so exactly. funny because you, okay, again, you and Kelsey are very similar. Kelsey is very well put <laughs> together. She chooses her words very carefully. And when she throws out something that's like sincere and real and has a strong, well, she's very strongly opinionated for sure. But something <laughs> like that, where you reveal yourself, it, I have the same reaction where I'm like, Oh, now I like you. Okay. I like, mm. and then I can relate to you on some way, maybe because I did the same things and maybe other people would look at you and say, now I don't like you because you did that. But like, that's how, that's how you, I just really like that. <laughs> <cats. laughs> but that's how you connect with people is by, sh- by sharing these things. So to, to sum this up, the night, the nice guy, in my opinion, doesn't let any of that stuff out about them because they mm. just try to show perfection. They try to please and make people right, happy. And, and there's, not no, there's nothing there about them. They're not even a part of the equation. So I think that that's something for guys to realize because you talked about the importance of, you know, not, not, not being nice. I forget how you phrased it. What do you say? The importance of, of, of overcoming being so nice. Um, because mm. when you're being too nice, you're forgetting about how to express yourself. And so all, all the strategies yeah. that we provided, I think are really good because it's going to let guys take an outside view of how they're presenting themselves to the world and whether or not that's in line with how they want to be seen. That's something that I did a very long time ago. I kept seeing myself in my head as this really outgoing, like boisterous character. I would In my head, I would dance on tables, but in reality, I wasn't doing any of that. I was frozen. I was paralyzed. I was f- shameful. I was fearful of everybody thinking something about me. And so when I took a step back and said, okay, I want to, I want to be this person. How do I get to here? I think that that's where the process starts by saying, I don't want to be this anymore. And here's the visual of who I would like to be. And that's how you can start to piece those things together. So if you want to be more communicative, if you want to be a part of more conversations, being a part of more conversations means speaking up sharing your opinion, expressing yourself. So then you can start to do each of those things. And it's baby step by baby step. You build in to this new vision of yourself. Katya, thank you so much for coming onto our show and explaining to guys how to overcome being a nice guy. And more importantly, explaining from your point of view as a woman, why it's not so nice to be so nice as a woman. Mm, Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Do you want to tell people how they can get in contact with you, work with you, hang out with you, Yeah, you know, go look at cats yeah, together. Absolutely. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you guys for having me gals for having me. I so enjoyed this conversation and thanks for creating the space for me to be real. You know, I think that's one of the awesome things that we get to do for humans for yeah. each other is to like really give us our, give each other the space to show up as as authentic and real. So thank you so much for being that for me in this conversation. And yeah, I am all about making, you know, one-to-one 
relationships. I love talking to people. I love it when people ask me questions. I'm happy to give some, you know, quick feedback. Um, an easy way to get a hold of me is I, I post a lot on my Facebook page, both my personal and my uh, business page. But if you want to find me at facebook.com forward, forward slash love coach Katya, you can sign up for a effortless attraction session where I will get on the phone with you and tell you exactly what's getting in the way of you attracting the kind of woman that you really want and the steps that you needed to take in order to do that. Amazing. Yeah. That's fantastic. So that is how you can find me. Okay, wonderful. And Kristen, tell people how to work with you. Hey. So yeah, if you guys want to just chat with me, you can uh, do it right through kristenandchill.com and I can uh, give you more lines like the cat one earlier about <laughs> the cat's ass thing. Yes. So that's kristenandchill.com. I love it. And if you want to work with me or find out more about me, you can go to winggirlmethod.com. You can also go to my YouTube channel youtube.com slash Marnie Kinneris. I have about 500 videos up there with baby step advice on how to do things, how to attract women, get women, escalate with women, everything on there. I also post um, the episodes of Ask Women Podcast on YouTube right now. It's on that same channel, youtube.com slash askwomen. And new episodes of the Ask Women Podcast come out on every other platform for listening to a podcast. And they come out every Thursday at 5 p.m., Pacific. So you can go and download the episodes or stream the episodes, however you want to listen. Uh, you guys are awesome. We would not be at over 300 episodes without your support. We keep growing our listeners and you guys are, are, are wonderful that you still want to hear us after all these years. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you next week. 